Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to this webinar organized by the Elise Foundation and Liberal Friends. My name is Gijs Schwarzenberg and I will be your moderator tonight. A big thank you goes to many people who have helped us make this webinar possible. I mentioned Michiel Hoogmoed, Martijn Mengerink, Sebastian Vliegen, Mitchell Slijf, and especially Rudy van der Wel from Liberal Friends. And what a program we have for you tonight. At, uh, we have Wim Fleuren from the Energy Cooperation, the Omslag, who will inform you about the enormity of the task that is called the energy transition. We have Matthijs Beckers, chairman of the Elise Foundation, who wants to remove obstacles to the rapid growth of clean energy in the Netherlands and beyond. And then we have our keynote speaker, Jacopo Bongiorno. I'll tell you more about him later on. <clears throat> We're also in the company of Nilofer Gundogan, number two on the list of, of a political party, Volt, a new political party with a progressive program, and Volt has succeeded in looking at nuclear energy with an open mind. And Mark Harbis, of course, number seven on favor day list for the House of Representatives elections on Wednesday. For the panel discussion, we have several other interesting guests that we, I will introduce to you later. This webinar is being recorded and will be published on Elisa's YouTube channel later on. Uh, in fact, it is already live streamed. If people cannot log in, send them to the Elise website and you will find the live stream. So here's the program for tonight. Um, at uh, 19.35, in a couple of minutes, we will start with the energy transition, the scope of the task and where we stand. This will be done by Wim Fleuren of the Energy Corporation, the Omslag. And 15 minutes later, uh, Matthijs Beckers uh, gives his presentation about the critical role of the government. And then at five minutes past eight, we have our keynote uh, speech tonight, nuclear uh, versatile and clear energy, energy source for the 21st century, presented by Jacopo Bongiorno. There are 21, we will have a panel discussion and uh, you as the audience will also uh, be able to vote on several uh, sentences that we that we will present to you and the panel will discuss uh, your answers and around uh, 21 30 it will be the end i will be keeping a close watch on the time because we have a lot of ground to cover uh, before you we continue there's a few household notices um, questions questions can be submitted through the chat box it says here that the chat box opens five minutes before the speaker ends. We have changed that and now you will be able to ask your notes and questions in the chat box. Please limit yourself to a few questions because there are very many participants and uh, the chance of your everybody's questions getting through uh, will be limited by people posing too many questions. Um, so maybe I can have the presentation of Wim Fleuren uh, on screen now. And while the presentation is on screen, I will introduce uh, Wim Fleuren. Or when Wim is working on it, I will introduce him. Uh, Wim Fleuren has told me he was born at 316 parts per million. He is a civil engineer, a specialist in climate adaptation for the built environment, and also secretary of the energy corporation, the Omslag at Voerendaal in Limburg. He is also all electric, a vegan and a cyclist. According to Wim Fleuren, it is currently completely unclear how our electricity network can be stable when using only sun and wind. It is also completely unclear what the control mechanism to keep the grid stable will cost. It is also completely unclear what the cost will be of the transitional infrastructure we would ultimately need to keep our lights on. In his opinion, particularly adjustable small scale nuclear energy should be considered as part of the solution. And the sooner we start thinking about this, the better we can control the transition costs. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Wim Fleuren. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, thank you for your introduction. Um, I'm very happy to uh, speak here uh, because we have a very big task ahead. And uh, I want to give you uh, 
slight overview what is happening the next years, next 10 years and the years uh, behind that, so the following 20 years. Uh, I will go to, to this very quickly because I only have limited time uh, and uh, we see what we can uh, convey. Um, um, let me see this one, yeah. I want to start with uh, a nice graph. This is the Osborne effect. If you have one system and you want to convert to another, you will suffer from the Osborne effect. This is the effect uh, written down for the car industry. So we all know we have the combustion engines and we want to go electric. Uh, what you tend to do is you, you uh, extend the lifetime of your old car and uh, uh, save maybe some money and then at a certain instant you will buy the new one. In the meantime, we speak about confusion. You don't really know what to do. And what happens is that uh, there's a, a sales drop, a tremendous sales drop in cars, in new cars. Um, um, this is a big problem for the car industry. Um, uh, Volkswagen, they said, well, we know this and we want to keep this confusion as small as possible. And before 2025, we want to have uh, only electrical cars. If they manage to do that, I don't know, but that's their goal. They, they really committed to making this change and to keep um, an eye on the Osborne effect. This will happen to all things mattering about the uh, transition. This doesn't matter what you think about uh, transition, this will happen. <coughs> Talking about transition, this is not a linear thing. We have four different pathways if you talk about the energy transition that's ahead of us. First, of course, we have the supply side transition. Uh, decarbonizing means electrification. So in the electrification process, we have all kinds of, of changes going to happen. The demand side, of course, if you have intermittent um, 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 uh, commodities like wind and solar, you, you have to adopt as a client to this new um, reality. But it's not only demand and supply, it's also finance. Uh, everything finance that has to do with, with energy is affected. Uh, take for instance, taxes. Um, we all know in the Netherlands that two thirds of that what we pay for energy is tax. And so that's a big, big amount. It's about, I don't know, between 15 and 20 billion euros per year that's taxed on, uh, on energy. So what will happen with that? And the last, it's maybe uh, a little bit forgotten. We have the land use uh, 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 transition um, because it, the, the energy transition will take space. This is the scenic view in our town, one kilometer from my home. Um, and I will ask you, where do we put the windmills, turbines? Where do we put the solar fields? I can't see that. So clearly, um, scenery like this has value. It costs nothing, but it has value. And how do we go uh, with, with this value? How do we value value? Value like things like this. So the four pathways are a very complicated thing. It's a balanced thing. The one thing has to do with the other. And the next 10 years, we have to find some way getting through. And we do that by the regional energy strategy. It's for the next 10 years. Our objective is to produce 30, 35 terawatt hours of green energy uh, before 2030. Um, don't panic, we will manage because uh, right now we have good view on what will come the next 10 years. And uh, as, as far as the, the figures are now uh, available, uh, we will do that. The Netherlands is split in 30 different regions, so every region has his task. So um, I think this is, this is a good strategy for the next 10 years. Um, two very important things um, in this strategy is uh, two words, participation. Uh, people have to participate in the, in the transition. They have to be involved. They have to play a key role. And we have the possibility to have 50% local ownership. So it is possible 
that you become an entrepreneur in your own town uh, in wind and solar. And um, an energy corporation is a, uh, uh, an, enter an enterprise of uh, citizens working on that. So if you are not already a member of a corporation, find one in your neighborhood and you'll be happy to be an entrepreneur in the energy transition. <coughs> this is our task. Um, it's a little bit complicated, but we are now in uh, uh, 2020, the blue lines, and the agenda verdict uh, uh, was just reached because uh, we had COVID. So we are in the 25% below 1990. But then in the next 10 years, we still have to do some, something extra to, get, to reach the 49. So 55 megatons of CO2 reduction is necessary. After that, an even bigger task uh, lies ahead because we do have to do uh, an extra 104. This is a tremendous task I will show you. <clears throat> to have the general concept, this is a fossil country. This is the Netherlands. Um, on the left side, you see what's input. On the right side, you see what's output. We have 930, mind, 930 terawatt hours input, mainly of natural gas. On the right side, you can see what we do with it. And in the, in the, in the, in the uh, red um, square, uh, circle, you can see that 60% of that we put in is wasted. So, there's enormous waste in energy when you have a, a mainly thermal fossil industry. And this gives some opportunity of reduction, of course, and um, more efficiency and um, uh, to change our, uh, our total system. This waste is vast, enormous. 60% is wasted. Well, a little bit, uh, let's go a little bit personal. The, the White House is the, the house that we used to live in for 27 years. Uh, it's a fossil house. We had a fossil car, a diesel car. And the red one is the new house that we live in right now. It's all electric. It's uh, with wood, uh, uh, how do you say, um, wood frame uh, uh, building. Uh, we have an electric car. And what you can see, we don't go into it too far, is that the electricity use uh, uh, compared to the old house, rose threefold. So because everything is electric, of course, you have a bigger electrical need. It rises threefold. So uh, the, the 3,400 in the original house became 11,000 in the new house. But the total energy that I consumed in the, in the old house compared to the new house, uh, that dropped to one third, so two thirds of the energy, so it must be sixty-six percent, is uh, not being wasted by going electric. So this is a very big uh, thing that we see. This is actually happening. This graph is only there to let you see what will happen if you go electric. The dotted line is a an estimate what will happen to the total energy uh, consumption in the Netherlands between now and 2050. You see that the dotted line is gradually going down. So the more that we go electric, the less energy we use because we don't waste as much. We go from 950 today to 600, according to this graph, 600 in the future, in 2050. This is a very uh, nice um, report. It's from TNO. Uh, everybody should read this. It's a transform scenario. Um, on the left side, you see <coughs> the capacity that is installed, and you can see that it's only solar and wind. There's a little bit biomass. Uh, there is no nuclear. This is what we are uh, on the scheme to. Um, uh, on the right side, you see that 71% of the total energy in 2050, according to this uh, scenario, will be electric. So, combining the two things, um, we have 350 terawatt hours, 71% of electric, 
So that means that we have 100% will be 500 terawatt hours necessary in the future. So that's almost half the terawatt hours we use right now, today. But this is very important. Today, we have 111 terawatt hours of energy, electric. And in the future, we have to do 350. So that means that we have to triple the total energy production by 2050. So that's an enormous task. And uh, if we don't plan that and we don't uh, uh, make uh, calculations, uh, make the, the four pathways in, in balance, uh, this will, uh, yeah, uh, will not be possible. <coughs> this is a very colorful graph. It's not very, not worth very much. It's from the IEA, but what I'd like is the, the most, the, the nice colors, but also the way of to reach the goals. There is no simple or single solution to reach the sustainable energy goals. Nuclear here is a very thin um, pink line. What I'd like to see though, and what I'd like to talk about is behavioral change, it's the uh, one from below the bottom. Behavioral change is that what we do, your choice, what do you do? And I will ask you, is this sustainable? The way that we live, the way that we uh, move around in our world. And this is one aspect only, this is um, animals. If you have, maybe you know this graph, uh, this is um, the earth land mammals by weight. So in the middle, the humanoids, uh, ourselves, and what's around us, that's our livestock. Goats, sheep, uh, uh, cattle. And the green line, the green dots, are the wild animals around us. So uh, elephants, giraffes, uh, bears. And you see that our impact on nature is tremendous. So we have to think what we do with this. What's our thought about this? It's not sustainable, in my belief. It's also very important to know what we eat. If you're a meat lover... Two minutes to go, Erwin. It's no problem. I have two slides. It's, um, if you're a meat lover, you will um, produce much more CO2 than if you're very vegetarian or a vegan. So uh, if all Dutch would co convert to vegan, it would save 70 metric tons. So our goals would be much more easy to achieve if all the Dutch would go vegan. It's also better for your BMI. Another question is, how do you commute? Uh, do you walk? You go by cycle, e-bike, speed pedelec? Do you own a BEV? And at work, uh, do you use your own car? Or have, uh, does your, uh, your boss have a, a mobility as a service service uh, where you only drive with this service when it's necessary. And the question you can ask yourself is, when is the last time that you use public transport? These are very trivial questions, of course, but if you don't answer these and, uh, and just uh, go ahead and, and drive with your car, uh, well, you don't really understand what we are facing, I think. So the takeaways. We are far behind. Uh, when you see it in Europe, uh, but we catch up fast. For the next 10 years, whatever we do is good enough. But, uh, because we have a lot of in the pipeline. But the next 10 years, we also have to make sure that we have plans for the next, the following 20 years, from 2030 to 2050. We have to find the euros to build that. We have to know what we have to do. So make it a task. And then if it's 2020, uh, we build as fast as possible. You have to think of Osborne. And the earlier we start, the more resources we have to change. Behavioral change is very different, difficult. Do you fly? Wait, how do you go on vacation? Behavioral change is a very big driving force. So the act is to change now. Participation 50%. Uh, join your local energy corporation. If you do that, it's a very nice uh, environment. All things are electrified, so 
um, it's it's uh, I could say it's uh, it's very uh, uh, very nice to do uh, things like this. Um, and the transition can be done, I believe, but only with public trust and support. And I can suggest only that for the next 10 years, we make a very big effort to all um, commodity supplied. So for instance, uh, LNG, but also uh, uh, hydrogen, and also um, uh, uh, nuclear. Thank you. How about that? Thank you, uh, Wim. Um, Rudy, have you got any uh, clarifying questions for Wim? I'm not hearing Rudy. I think we will shall move on to Matthijs Beckers. I think he's ready already. Uh, Wim, if you can unshare his screen and uh, maybe Matthijs can start uh, sharing his screen. Okay. All right. Can you see my presentation? Sure. Okay. Um, a short introduction. Um, Matthijs Beckers, you already heard him, is a writer and he's a documentarist. And for years he has been vlogging for his YouTube channel, The Nuclear Humanist. A couple of days from now, he is going to release his full documentary, Atom Exit, about the energy situation in Germany. And since December 30, he's also the chairman of the new NGO, the Elise Foundation. In his presentation, Matthijs Beckers will explain why nuclear energy is such an important asset. And he's going to point out why the government has a critical role to play in facilitating, facilitating new nuclear builds. Matthijs, go ahead. And do that within 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> can, I, can everybody see my presentation? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, the critical role for of, the critical role of the government in a energy transition. Um, this title is not taken lightly. If you look at uh, everything that has been done in the last couple of years in terms of energy, the government has had a hand in it. Now, let's go to the next slide. Let's see. Wait a second. <laughs> for some reason, it won't switch. There we go. So uh, who are we, who we are? Uh, the ELISA Foundation is a foundation uh, of uh, nuclear experts, economists, uh, strange guys like me. And we have one goal, and that is to maximize the chance that nuclear power plants get built in the Netherlands. That's basically it. That's all we do. That's the only thing we focus on. So this meeting is particularly prescient because as you can see, we are at the cusp of new elections in the Netherlands. Today, we have a person from the VVD and we have a person from Volt. And if you look carefully, as it stands now, this is not a guarantee, by the way, I, I don't own a crystal ball, so don't ban on this. Um, these two parties are going to get 40 seats and you need 76 seats in order to get a majority. So something has to happen, um, you know, that makes uh, a coalition possible that wants to do nuclear in the Netherlands. So the Dutch problem is pretty straightforward. We use a lot of energy. You've seen it before in uh, Wim Fleuren's uh, presentation. Uh, we use about 800 to 1000 terawatt hours per year. Uh, we have very limited space. One seventh of our country has been as is built environment. So it's not just covered, it's built environment. And all the rest is mainly agrarian. So farm animals, uh, crops, you name it. So if we look at the most optimistic uh, scenarios, like the transform scenario that Wim just shared with us, we may end up getting 200 to 400 terawatt, year, terawatt hours per year from wind and solar. That's a sizable chunk of energy. However, this will not get us to where we need to be. And I understand that people like electrification, but it's far too simple to suppose that, electrif that we can electrify everything, uh, especially when we are going to move towards hydrogen, Hydrogen, the, the, the 
the therm thermodynamics of hydrogen aren't that great. You will lose a lot of energy down the road, which means that we will probably keep, you know, our primary energy usage will stay high regardless of what we do, especially if we add hydrogen, synthetic fuels, if we need to change, you know, the way we produce fertilizer, steel, cement, you name it. And the biggest problem that we have is that we forgot that nuclear was an option. So we had the climate tables a couple of years ago. And basically what they did is they, they, they miscalculated. They said, well, nuclear cannot possibly uh, uh, play a role before 2030. So we leave it off the table. And that's a critical mistake. This is also a mistake that you know, is somewhat tied to the government. And then finally is the bureaucracy. If you look at the bureaucracy in the Netherlands, you know, from start to finish, if you want to start a project until you put the first spade into the ground, that's going to take at least six to eight years, especially if you want to do a nuclear power reactor. So a lot has to happen to make nuclear possible in the Netherlands. So what we have done as Elisa is we have written a white paper. Now, don't you worry. Nothing is wrong with your eyes. You cannot read this because I've made it impossibly small to read. It's just to give you an idea of, of, of the amount of work that has gone into this white paper. It's got 42 references. It's, uh, I believe it's, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's 30 somewhat paper, uh, it's 30 somewhat pages. And we have pretty much analyzed every bit that you could analyze from, you know, a perspective of somebody who wants to build a nuclear power plant in the Netherlands. And what we've come up with is 13 suggestions for the government, for political parties uh, to take it to consideration if they really want to push on uh, with this nuclear uh, uh, renaissance in the Netherlands. Now, we do have a beautiful 500 megawatt reactor in Bosla, which we, which we will see later on, uh, but it's really time for a renaissance. So what does nuclear have to offer to us? I mean, um, other than loads of energy in a, in a box the size of a postage stamp, which is basically something that we need right now because we have very limited space, uh, I firmly, firmly do believe that it will help us create a better future for our children. That's including wind, that's including solar, that's including hydrogen, geothermal, you name it. Nuclear is just, I believe, the capstone technology in sustainable energy. So if you look at uh, the versatility of nuclear, it's amazing. Now, what you see here is exactly what we want to get rid of. This is, this is like a, an oil gas drilling station somewhere in the ocean uh, or on the sea. Now, we can, we can use the heat and the electricity that comes out of a nuclear reactor or, or that gets produced with the heat that comes out of a nuclear reactor to create hydrogen, clean water, district heat, aviation fuel even. And these are all commodities that, will be, that we will need in the future to, to make our world more sustainable. This is also, if you look at the thermodynamics, this means that you will be putting energy into something and you won't get all of it out of it. So if you put in 100 kilowatt hours into creating hydrogen, you may end up using 20 kilowatt hours effectively. So it's, 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 going to be, it's going to be very hard to do this decarbonization challenge. So what must happen? What must me do? Um, first of all, uh, in the Netherlands, we have a history of subsidizing uh, uh, nascent technologies like uh, biomass, wind, geothermal and solar. What you see here are our budgets that, we, that, that we've created in successive years uh, to stimulate the building of solar panels, windmills, you name it. And if we tally all of this up, it, it, it amounts to 50 billion euros. Now, they don't expect to pay out 50 billion euros. If we, if we tally up what they expect to pay, it's 30 billion euros. So it's still a lot of money. And this is not, you know, this is not the entire cost of the transition. This is just 
the subsidy that the, that the government is giving to the people who want to deploy these sustainable technologies. So if you look at, for instance, an X300, a BWR X300, which is, which is a, 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 a reactor concept that is being designed right now, it's a smaller design. It's a 300 megawatt reactor. It's basically slightly smaller than our Borsala reactor. If we would build 15 gigawatts of these reactors at the current, and, and we look at the price that is being promised to us, which still needs to be realized, which is a big caveat, we could potentially build 15 gigawatts of nuclear capacity for a price between 35 and 75 billion euros. Now, if you look at, at, at for instance, the price that we pay as a consumer, that's 220 euros per megawatt hour. And if we manage to do all the things right, we could, we could get electricity from these units in a, in a, and this is a very broad range, somewhere between 30 and 60 euros per megawatt hour. And that's roughly, you know, in the same ballpark as what we pay today. Uh, we're around 40, 41 euros per megawatt hour wholesale price. So if we can manage to get near 40 euros per megawatt hour, we're golden. But this is, this is a thing, um, you know, in the Netherlands, our prime minister told uh, an audience that he wanted to build a nuclear reactor in Groningen. And this was something that was, you know, it wasn't received well. But Zeeland, on the other hand, is one of those provinces who does want to build a nuclear reactor. So what I've done is I, I, I've been cheeky. Uh, I, I've taken the rough uh, footprint of a X300 reactor and I transposed that onto an area which used to be uh, a used for coal fire power plant. And it turns out that you can, can build roughly 2.7 gigawatts. Now, don't, it, it might be less. We may need area for cooling towers because maybe they, they, they demand that you build cooling towers instead of using a once through uh, cooling cycle. But in any case, if you look at the, the potential, the Netherlands has 15 gigawatts of existing coal and gas capacity. And if we would replace all of that with nuclear, that would, that would mean a lot. That would mean a tremendous lot. That would mean that we would cut, I mean, several megatons of uh, carbon emissions each year. Now, why do I focus personally on SMRs? Because I'm ambivalent to what gets built. If, it, if somebody wants to build an EPR, go build an EPR. If somebody wants to build an EPR 1400, which is a Korean design, go build that. But why would I personally choose an SMR? Uh, that, that's because we really need to augment the speed with which we deploy these plants. And if we can build them smaller, and if we can do it for less money, and if we can use, uh, if we can move towards an industry which is like the gas industry, if you if you order a gas plant, all of these components basically come ready to be installed on site. Now that's what you want to have with a nuclear power reactor as well. So that's why I'm personally a, a, a very big proponent of SMRs. Um, two, two, two minutes, uh, Matthijs. Yeah, the nuclear elephant, you know, the elephant in the room, everybody's talking about renewables. We are talking about, you know, nuclear energy. Um, it's, it, it's a hard sell, you know, because there's so many political problems, people who are opposed to it due to the waste and due to this and that and the other thing. And I think that we really need to start working consciously about addressing all those issues and solving them. That's the only way we are going to decarbonize with wind, solar, geothermal, and all the other stuff. But if we can build 15 gigawatts of nuclear, small modular reactors, big reactors, I don't care what, I mean, that would be a tremendous, uh, that would be really, really cool. But it takes the government to do it. And this is the last thing I want to say about this, because 
um, on the 17th of this month, we are going to elect a new government. And uh, I'm, I'm afraid that, that people from these parties are going to use nuclear as a bargaining chip. And this is something we really need to avoid. We really need to avoid that people are going to use nuclear as a bargaining chip. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthijs. Um, Rudy, are there any uh, clarifying questions asked for Matthijs? Nope. Don't think so. Okay. Um, well, then we have our next speaker. Uh, Matthijs, if you can unshare your screen and um, Jacopo, when you would start sharing your screen and I will introduce you. I just did. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, uh, this is uh, the, 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 uh, our keynote speech for tonight. Uh, Jacobo Bongiorno is a professor of nuclear science and engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the Netherlands, better known as MIT. In 2016 to 18, he led the MIT study on the future of nuclear energy in a carbon constrained world. He's internationally recognized by friend and foe as one of the most outstanding this is one, uh, as one of the most outstanding studies about the future of nuclear energy. In essence, the study seeks out to answer the question, how can the world achieve the deep carbon emissions reductions that are necessary to slow or reverse the impact of climate change? In his presentation, Bongiorno demonstrates the need for nuclear energy from various angles. The strong growth in demand for energy worldwide, the strongly increasing demand for raw materials and the need to produce less waste. To arrive at the important question of how the economic model of nuclear energy can be strengthened. Ladies and gentlemen, Jacopo Bongiorno. Yes, thank you very much for inviting me. Please confirm that you can hear me and see me well. I hear you very well. Wonderful. Wonderful. So I decided to title my presentation today, Nuclear Versatile and Clean Energy Source for the 21st Century. And uh, in, in the presentation, I will leverage the main findings from the study that just just mentioned uh, that I led at MIT between two, 2016 and 2018. I want to start on a light note first. This is a uh, so-called bathtub curve because it looks like a bathtub. Um, and uh, it's... Um, uh, basically a curve that describes uh, human attention uh, during a presentation as a function of time. And uh, countless psychological studies have shown that this is how our uh, mind really works. So I get uh, your attention now at the beginning of the presentation. Um, then uh, many of you will sort of slip through the next 40 minutes. And then at the end, when I snap my fingers and say conclusions, you'll, uh, you know, you'll pay attention again. Uh, the, you know, jokes aside, the implication of this is that I need to give you the most important messages up front, and then I will reiterate them again at the very end. So let me, let me just state up front, therefore, what are the main takeaways for this presentation? Uh, the five things that, that you should take away from it are the following. Uh, first, if you are in the business of deeply decarbonizing the uh, power sector, as well as other sectors of the economy, then I will show quantitatively that it makes a lot of sense to have nuclear in the energy mix, it has a very high value. Um, and number two, if you're interested in uh, the traditional large nuclear power plants, uh, PWRs, BWRs, that people have been building for decades, uh, then there is actually a set of suppliers that have been able to build them uh, over the past few years on time and on, and on budget. And uh, unfortunately, they're not in, in our countries, in, in the Western world, but they are the Republic of Korea, Russia, and China. Um, I, I do believe consistently with the previous presentation that there are opportunities for cost and financial risk reduction um, if we transition, at least in the US and Western Europe, to smaller, simpler, and more serially manufactured uh, nuclear systems that can also benefit from accelerated testing and licensing. So we'll spend a little bit of time talking about this. Um, very, very important, uh, the uh, CO2 emissions in, uh, in, in, in the Netherlands or in the US are associated with the power grid only for about a quarter. So again, if we want to truly decarbonize our, our countries, we need to look beyond uh, only electricity. And that's where 
um, uh, nuclear can help, as, as as it was mentioned just a minute ago. You can, you know, you can of course provide uh, heat directly to factories that require uh, heat for their processes. You can generate hydrogen to be used in transportation. You can desalinate water for countries that don't have access to a lot of fresh water and, and so on and so forth. And then the last point I will make, it's a little bit more US centric, but uh, you probably know in the US, the Republicans and the Democrats disagree on everything under the sun. There is uh, maybe only a couple of topics on which they agree. And by some kind of a miracle, nuclear happens to be one of these two topics. So we are at, at a you know at a good junction uh, at least for in terms of political support in the U.S. So those are the takeaway messages, and now I'm going to tell you the story with the support of charts, curves, numbers, and all of that. So let, let me start. The first part of my presentation is going to be about what I call the value proposition of nuclear in a low carbon world. So I will systematically compare nuclear to other energy sources, uh, uh, mostly to emphasize what it's unique about nuclear. Uh, let me just be clear. I'm not here to sort of black ball solar and wind. Uh, or any other energy source. I just want to point out what is uh, unique and special about nuclear with respect to other uh, to other energy sources. So a question that I often get is uh, uh, about the, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions of different energy sources. And people ask, well, we understand that a nuclear power plant does not emit CO2, but, uh, but it does uh, take uh, CO2 and other carbon intense activities to maybe build the plant or to mine uh, uranium ore to, to get the fuel for transportation, operation, decommissioning, waste disposal, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, life cycle uh, greenhouse gas emissions studies have been run for, uh, at this point, uh, by, by many different sources. And uh, the conclusion is that nuclear, along with uh, renewables, has indeed a very, very low life cycle greenhouse gas uh, footprint. So if you look at the, 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 the charts here, uh, it's measured in grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour per unit energy, or in this case, electricity generated. You can see nuclear down there compares very, very favorably when everything is included with, uh, with wind in particular. It's about uh, half uh, what you get from hydropower and solar. Um, the other question, which is, uh, I think, a lot more intuitive, is uh, in terms of land utilization. And, you know, I, obviously the Netherlands is a fairly small country. And as was pointed out just a few minutes ago, it's already packed. So if uh, you need to use land for your energy infrastructure, you better use energy sources that don't take a lot of land. So let me just sort of quantitatively compare nuclear to, to solar and wind, which are the other two low carbon energy sources here. So the picture that you see here is a large nuclear power plant in, in France. It generates about 5,200 megawatts of electricity. Just to give you an idea, that's enough electricity to power a city of say 4.5 million people. So it's a lot of electricity. It operates 24 seven. You're around with a capacity factor, if you wish availability of about 90%. And it sits on less than a square mile. So you can, you can, uh, create a figure of merit that is the amount of electricity generated per unit surface area, and you get about 6,000 megawatt per square mile for nuclear. And you won't be surprised to, to learn that uh, for wind and solar, of course, you're going to need a lot more land. Okay, so these are two examples here in the United States, big wind farms, big solar solar plants. And when you, you use the same criteria and use the same figure of merit, you basically come down by a factor of 100, two orders of magnitude lower than for nuclear. So that, that has to be taken in, into account, particularly in country like the Netherlands where land is, is at a premium, maybe a little bit less so in, in parts of the United States where we have a lot of land that is, that is un, 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 unutilized. Um, now, building plants, whether they are solar, nuclear, wind, uh, natural gas, et cetera, of course, takes also materials. Um, and and uh, with materials comes mining and all the processing that, uh, that, that, that is required. Uh, so materials uh, utilized in the construction of plants include, of course, cement, uh, steel, concrete, glass, and, and others. And you can see here how nuclear stacks up to, um, uh, to other energy sources in terms of literally the mass or weight of materials per unit energy generated. And so on the left hand side, you have renewables, which are very, very materials intensive. And on the right hand side, you have nuclear and fossil fuels, which tend to be a lot more efficient in terms of, in terms of uh, materials utilization by, by an order of magnitude easily, as you can see here. 
Now, the um, a, a major concern and, and in, in somewhat justified is, of course, uh, radioactive or, or nuclear waste. So the, the first item, the first point that I always make is that people have to realize that the volumes are very, very small. So, so think about it in these terms. If a person, an individual like me or you, were to use only nuclear energy throughout his or her lifetime, um, the amount of high level waste, a radioactive, highly radioactive waste that would be generated would basically fit within, within that little plastic cup. So the volumes are small. Now, of course, if you are serving the energy needs of millions of people, you know, the cup adds up. But so then the question is, how does that compare to, to other energy sources? And again, it compares very, very favorably. These are projected waste volumes for solar, wind, and nuclear, and, and you can see, uh, actually nuclear, you can barely see it. I have to put a little arrow there because in terms of uh, the amount of, of, uh, of uh, waste that produced, it would be uh, you know, hundreds of times less than, than what we have for solar, for solar and wind. And, and, and really all of this stems from a very basic uh, physical characteristic of, of nuclear energy, which is the uh, enormous energy density of, of the fuel and therefore the ability to realize a, uh, a high power density machine uh, with very, very low, very low volume and, and small amount of materials. Um, now, the other concern, of course, is associated with, with accidents or, uh, or, or releases or radioactivity into the environment under operations. Uh, this is not a particular, particularly uh, cheerful way to compare different energy sources, but it's a rational way. You can look at the mortality or rate of fatalities per unit um, energy generated. And even when you include um, casualties from uh, uh, high profile accidents such as Chernobyl, which actually had some radiation exposure related uh, casualties. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the safety record for, for nuclear is, is quite outstanding, uh, particularly compared to, um, uh, to fossil fuels, which uh, of course uh, generate a lot of air pollution and therefore a lot of uh, uh, respiratory diseases. Now, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the, my presentation and the previous presentations are focused on, on the future. Uh, how are we going to decarbonize? But we should start from sort of a snapshot of where we are now. So uh, nuclear already constitutes the backbone of uh, the uh, clean energy infrastructure in important uh, regions of the world, including the United States and Europe. Um, so what is shown here is the share of carbon-free electricity uh, worldwide, about 50% of that share is hydro, 30% nuclear, and then 20% solar and wind. But in the United States, nuclear accounts for over 50% of our carbon-free electricity. Uh, in the EU, is similar. And in places like the Republic of, of, of Korea, which is where I gave a similar presentation a few weeks ago, that percentage goes up to uh, almost 90%. So it's already a very, very important part of, uh, of, of the clean energy infrastructure. Now, what are the trends? Well, we're seeing a uh, quite impetuous uh, growth in places like China, India, Russia, and the Middle East of nuclear. And unfortunately, we're seeing some decline in, in Western Europe, Japan, and also in the United States with different reasons and, and with different rates, but, uh, but certainly uh, the picture doesn't look too rosy in the West and, and in Japan. Now, I'm gonna show you the results of an interesting study which focuses on Europe. Um, and it was performed by a European NGO a couple of years ago. They looked at the um, uh, a comparison of all the different uh, European countries in terms of their energy policy, the uh, uh, utilization of renewable energy, and the correlation between the utilization of renewable energy and the decarbonization of their power sector. So the first plot that is shown there shows the share of uh, essentially solar and wind generation over a period of one year in the 20 plus countries of the union. And over that period, the average generation of uh, solar and wind uh, electricity was about 20% in the union and about six countries were, six countries actually were at or above that average. And you can read them here, I hope you can see, Denmark, Ireland, Germany, Portugal, Spain, and Finland. So by definition, those are the countries that have invested the most in, in renewable energy. Now, what I'm gonna show you next is uh, the same 20 plus countries, but now rank according to the carbon footprint um, of their uh, power sector. By carbon footprint here, I mean, once again, the grams of CO2, the mass of CO2 uh, generated per unit energy generated. And so of course, that low number is, is a good thing here. So these are the same countries. Now they're ranked according to their footprint. 
And you can see that the six countries that had the lowest uh, carbon footprint um, of their power sector in Europe are Norway, Sweden, France, Switzerland, Finland, and Belgium. With the exception of Finland, which shows up in both groups here, you see that there is basically no correlation between these two groups. Now, what do the countries in the green box have to have, have in common with each other? Well, they decarbonize their power sector using either hydroelectric or nuclear or both. So once again, this is not to say that we don't need solar and wind. We do, and we should deploy as much as we can. But the, my point is that countries that in Europe have been already successful, and in some cases spectacularly successful, Norway, Sweden, and France in particular, at decarbonizing their power sector, they've done it with hydro and with nuclear. Now, many existing nuclear power plants um, in, in Europe and in the US uh, are approaching the end of their original license. They were licensed initially for about 40 years. And now the question is, are you going to decommission or are you going to extend the, the, the license of this uh, of these systems to say another 10, 20 years or whatever makes sense from a, an economic and, and, a safe, and a safety and a safety point of view. Now, if you decommission, we had a few examples in, in the US, uh, certainly there is an economic loss associated with it. Uh, literally thousands of, of well-paying jobs are, are lost and local tax revenues. And more importantly, in the context of the conversation that we're having today, the CO2 emissions invariably will go up. As we've seen it in places like Vermont, in California, in Massachusetts, uh, in, in Nebraska, et cetera, when nuclear power plants are permanently shut down, the emissions go up. And that's because the, uh, the, the uh, capacity that they were providing is typically replaced by a mix of natural gas, which is very cheap in the United States, and then a little bit of renewables. Uh, but but the, the, the net result is that the emissions go up. Now, um, extending the license of a nuclear plant is not free. So it requires an investment, it requires spending some money. And then the question is, is that investment justified? In other words, will the plant be profitable? So without getting into too many details, uh, we ran a few years back a, a study for Spain uh, if, around this question that I just asked. So the, um, it, in Spain, they have about seven reactors, seven gigawatts of, of uh, nuclear electricity. And the um, license for these reactors is gonna expire over the next 10 or 15 years. And the dilemma there is, should I just allow those reactors to shut down and be replaced by, by renewables and some storage if you wanna keep the same emissions that, that you have now, or should I make the investment and extend the license of these of, of this seven reactors? So we look at the four, five different scenarios. The one in green is I make the investment and relicense the uh, seven reactors for another 10, 15 years. And then in orange are the shut down the reactors and replace with all solar, all wind, 25 to 75% solar and wind or 75, 20, uh, 25 wind and solar. So the different different proportions there. And without making a long uh, a long story or making a long story short, the uh, the results are shown here. So if you make the investment and extend the license of the seven reactors in a place like Spain, it will incur an additional cost of the order of 35 euros per megawatt hour, which therefore is not cheap or it's not free at all. But the best you can do if you shut down the reactors and re replace it with an all renewable plus storage uh, scenario is with the uh, uh, rightmost scenario over, shown over here. And that's about twice as expensive as the extension of the, of, the nuclear, of the nuclear plant. So my point here, which we haven't done the analysis, might, might also apply to, to your current uh, plant bor in, in Borcel, is that uh, extending the lifetime of nuclear power plants uh, actually makes sense from an economic point of view. It's better than simply replacing them with new with new capacity. Now, I think the name of the game here is decarbonizing, which means extend the license of the reactors and uh, in addition also build uh, solar and wind, uh, uh, add solar and wind to your to your grid. So it's not an either or. It's actually an end end game that I think uh, that I think people have to understand. So what I've just described here at, has to do with um, uh, existing plants or near-term decarbonization. But ultimately, as was shown, I think, to present in, in the first presentation today, you need to deeply decarbonize. So you need to eliminate, say, 80% and plus of CO2 emissions uh, in the power sector, even higher than that, and in other sectors, similar, similar percentages. So the question is, do we need nuclear to do this very, very deep decarbonization? 
So um, this is going to be a fairly complicated um, slide, so I need to parse it out for you. Let me sort of give you the punchline up front. What we found in our study uh, through the analysis of many different regions of the world is that if you exclude nuclear energy or something that looks like nuclear energy, which means is um, CO2 free or low carbon and dispatchable or controllable, excluding such nuclear energy sources drives up the average cost of electricity in low carbon scenarios. That's really the punchline. Now, let me explain what you're looking at here on the left. So at MIT, we have developed and validated a model that basically looks at a, a region of the world. It could be uh, Europe or it could be a, a piece of the United States. It could be a province in, in China, as is shown in this particular example. And for that market, takes as input the hourly demand for electricity. So 8,760 entries for electricity. It also takes in as input the weather and patterns expected in that region uh, on an hourly basis. So how much wind, how much solar can you expect to get at most in that region at that particular hour of the day and throughout the year. Uh, then it also takes in cost of the different technologies, uh, nuclear, wind, solar, storage, uh, natural gas, coal, everything. And it crunches all these numbers and it gives off a, an optimal scenario, an optimal generation mix. And what do we mean by optimal here? It means a generation mix that will minimize the average generation cost of electricity in that market over the course of a year. So the figure of merit is shown here on the y-axis and it's the average generation cost, dollars per megawatt hour. Now we can run this model for different scenarios and the scenarios are shown with different colors here. So blue here would be nuclear is excluded, uh, orange is nuclear is included at nominal cost and gray is nuclear is included at a lower cost. And we can run these different scenarios for different decarbonization targets. So the last variable that you should pay attention to is on the x-axis here, is again the carbon intensity, CO2 emissions, grams per kilowatt hour, now for the whole system. So currently uh, in uh, worldwide, the uh, power sector uh, produces about 500 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So we are all the way to the, to the left there. And under the... Uh, uh, IPCC scenario, 1.5 degrees C, et cetera, we need to go well below 50 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So we need to go down by an order of magnitude. So think about the, uh, you know, the, the, the middle bars here and all the way to the right. So what does this plot uh, show us? Well, it shows us that if you have a scenario in which nuclear is excluded, which is the blue bars here, the average cost of electricity will actually go up exponentially as you try to hit these aggressive decarbonization targets. Whereas if you have nuclear, whether it's at nominal cost or lower cost, the average cost of electricity will stay, will stay more or less constant. Now you may wonder why on earth is this happening? And so the explanation is here. And again, these plots are a little bit difficult to, to maybe read, but what is shown now here is the total installed capacity. What this means is how much of the different technologies do I need in this particular region of the world if I want to hit those, um, those uh, decarbonization targets. And the top right um, uh, plot here shows the uh, install capacity in the case of no, no, no nuclear. In that case, if you're trying to decarbonize and you exclude nuclear, you're going to have to overbuild uh, renewables, solar, wind, and, and storage batteries dramatically because because of uh, storage of course is very important here because you need to be able to meet demand and so that that requires a lot of batteries on the other end uh, the bottom right uh, plot there shows you what the install capacity looks like if you have if you allow for nuclear to be part of the mix you can see that it stays more or less constant now if you can see my cursor also you will note that the scale here for these two plots is different by a factor of 10 so in other words this starts at 100,000 megawatt. This is less than 100,000 megawatt, which means basically this capacity is here about an order of magnitude lower than the big bar that you see up here. And so it's the total cumulative cost of these overbuilt infrastructure, solar, wind, and batteries that really determines the much higher average generation cost uh, if you exclude nuclear. So again, I apologize, this was a, uh, admittedly a complicated slide, but, it, but it, it contains a very, very important message, which is a rational decarbonized grid would actually include a lot of nuclear or something that looks like nuclear in the sense that I explained earlier. So let me move on. Um, another very important question is that we don't have a lot of time here. 
So if we're serious about reaching zero carbon or near zero carbon by 2050, then we need to deploy uh, energy sources or energy, new energy capacity very, very rapidly. So as part of our study, we look at the historic record of different energy sources. And uh, the figure of merit here is the average added kilowatt hour per capita per year. And we basically wanted to compare the best 10 years for the different technologies. And for nuclear, you have to go back a little bit to the uh, good old days, so to speak, of Sweden and France, when they were able to put a lot of new nuclear capacity over uh, online over a period of 10 years. And, and so those figures are the order of 700 uh, added the kilowatt hour per capita per year. And the, the best, the next best that we found was natural gas in, in the US uh, in the first decade of this century. It was about the same order of magnitude. Uh, coal also grow, uh, grew very rapidly in China between 20, 2005, 2014. And then uh, solar and wind have been growing uh, fast, but the, as you can see there, not fast enough. Um, and so the, the idea here is that once again, nuclear uh, historically has actually been the energy source that has scaled up uh, quickest. Now, whether we can reproduce those high uh, construction rates and high deployment rates remains to be seen, but at least we have an historical precedent that tells us that, that, that it's feasible. Okay, so all this was sort of good news. We, we seem to, you know, at least in, in our group at an MIT, we reached the conclusion that yes, we absolutely need nuclear if we're serious about deeply decarbonizing the economy. Now, uh, a, a, uh, you know, a, a concern that is on everybody's mind is I said, well, what about the cost of these new nuclear power plants? We've heard that, uh, you know, the French are taking much longer than they thought uh, to build new nuclear power, power plants and it, it costs a lot more and the same issues have been experienced in the US. So what's the deal with cost? Very good question. So a little tutorial up front. Uh, the um, the levelized cost of electricity, or LCOE, for a new nuclear power plant is largely dominated by the capital cost, basically the cost associated with building the plant. Um, operation and maintenance, including security, account for about 20%, and the fuel is really dirt cheap. So we, it, we basically need to focus on the, uh, if, if, if we want to reduce the cost of, of, a, of, an, of new nuclear, or electricity from new nuclear, we need to focus on the plant, because the fuel and the operation and maintenance are already pretty cheap. So as part of the study at MIT, we look at different designs um, of um, large gigawatt scale nuclear power plants. And the, uh, these names might not mean anything to you, but the AP1000 is an American design. APR1400 is a Korean design. EPR is a French design. And we wanted to see what is the breakdown of their uh, construction cost, of their capital cost. And, and it was interesting because these are three relatively similar, but also different in some ways technologies. And the breakdown was quite similar in all three cases. The first point is, if you can see my cursor, these dark blue and red slices here, those represent the direct cost of the equipment. So the pressure vessel, the pipings, the pumps, the control rods, et cetera, et cetera. And it only accounts for about a quarter of the total of the total. Uh, the biggest slice that you see here is what we decided to call yard cooling and installation, which really means is the civil works that is required to um, install the plant. So the preparation of the site, the excavation, the, uh, uh, the, the, the building of foundations, the erection of uh, reinforced concrete with all the rebar and the concrete that goes in it and all the labor that goes with it. That accounts for roughly half of the total cost of the new plant. And then the two other slices that you see here are the engineering cost, so the actual design uh, uh, of, of the plant. And then lastly, the owner's cost, which is mostly insurance, the cost of the land, et cetera. So the point here is that we were kind of surprised because we thought that the, uh, the, 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 the bulk of the cost for a new plant was the actual equipment that you have to buy from, say, Westinghouse, GE, or, or the French, et cetera, or Framatome. And, and it turns out that's not the case. So it matters dramatically how you actually build it, how you manage that big construction site, uh, much more so than, than sp specifically what technology you're, you're, you're building. So uh, we then proceeded to compare the, uh, the construction cost of different projects uh, over the past 10 years. And here there are two groups. There is the, the Virtues group on the left, mostly in Asia. And then there is the group of shame um, on the right, and that's the US and Europe. So first, let me tell you what, what you're looking at there in this plot. So this is the so-called overnight construction cost. So this is now dollars per kilowatt. 
So per install capacity, okay? And on the x-axis, you have different, um, different projects. So you have the APR 1400 in Korea and in the Emirates, and then you have a bunch of different designs in China. And on the right, you have the AP1000 in the US, the EPR in the UK, and the EPR in France, in France and Finland. And um, so the first impulse uh, or, or your first intuition might say, well, we're really building different technologies. And, and the answer is no. Yes, they are slightly different designs, but they're all large pressurized water reactors, gigawatt scale. They all look pretty similar, actually. So we, 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 we dig deep on this uh, through interviews and analysis, interviews with construction managers. And basically, we came up with two lists. One is shown at the bottom left and one is shown at the bottom right that are almost a perfect mirror image of each other. And so attributes that made the Asian projects very successful are essentially the same deficiencies that made the US and Europe projects very unsuccessful. So let me just walk you through this because this is an important um, sort of a set of findings from our study. Uh, the first is almost comical. Uh, in, in Asia, uh, very wisely, they do not break ground of a new large construction project until they finish designing the plan, at least 90% of the detailed design. By contrast, the projects in Europe started with less than 50% of the detailed design completed. And there were some commercial uh, pressure reasons for, for going that way in Europe, but they turn out to be disastrously deleterious in terms of the efficiency of the project. Um, the, second, the second bullet that you see there has to do with the supply chain. Now, countries like Korea, China, and even Japan before Fukushima, they had been building uh, new nuclear power plants continuously for, for many years. And so they had a proven um, supply chain and skilled labor workforce. That's not the case in the US and Europe where basically for 20 years, nobody built anything in nuclear. And therefore they had to uh, restart, uh, a re recreate a supply chain and, and the workforce was certainly not experienced. Um, the third bullet is also very important in my opinion. We found that in Asia, because these projects are a little bit more vertically integrated, the uh, fabricators and constructors of the plan are actually included in the design team from the early stages of the project. So you have essentially the companies that will ultimately build and uh, fabricate components are uh, part of the design team from the beginning. It means they can tell you right off the bat if that plan or that component can be built and can be fabricated, what the cost is gonna be, as opposed to a more uh, two-step process that we've seen in, in the US and Europe, where you basically had companies that designed the plant and then they passed the blueprints to uh, fabricators and constructors. And very often uh, it turned out that those uh, those blueprints or those designs were were not buildable. They're not they were they, they were not easy to, to fabricate. And so that required iterations which uh, which uh, um, added cost and, and and time. And then the last two bullets on either side are talking about the um, the way in which contracts and uh, and uh, the uh, the regulators operate and and in a more cooperative fashion in Asia and in a more confrontational way in in the U.S. and Europe. So interestingly, it had nothing to do with the technology. It has almost everything to do with these let me call them softer aspects of uh, of construction projects. Uh, let me skip this in the interest of time. Now there are a couple of aggravating factors for the difference in cost between the West and and Asia. Um, we have looked at the productivity of different sectors of the economy in the United States are shown here uh, as measured as uh, gross value added per hour worked, and um, as a function of time here, as a function of uh, over the past six decades. And interestingly, the construction sector, which is shown with that orange curve at the bottom, has seen a decline in its productivity since the mid 1960s. By contrast, uh, sectors like agriculture or importantly manufacturing have seen an exponential growth in productivity. So the implication here is that maybe we don't want the construction sector to build our plant. We want these plants to be uh, built in factories, manufacturing, because the productivity of that environment is certainly higher than, than construction sites. Quite, you know, put simply, in, in the West, we have lost the ability to build big things in construction sites. In Asia, they have not. They've actually become very proficient at doing that. The second aggravating factor, of course, is the cost of labor. In, in places like China and even Korea, uh, to a lesser extent, uh, the individual craft and, uh, and, and engineering positions uh, are paid a lot less 
tender paid in the US or, or in Western Europe. So we got our hands on these labor rates, uh, very detailed information in, in four countries, US, Korea, France, and China. And then we, we went through the following uh, thought exercise. We imagined that these four countries would build the exact same uh, nuclear reactor. We have a database that shows how many hours are associated with the individual tasks. Uh, we associated different uh, uh, craft and engineering tasks uh, to those, um, uh, you know, to, to those activities, and we rolled up the labor rates to basically show the price or cost differential between these four countries. And it turns out that just purely based on labor rates, uh, China, for example, uh, would be able to deliver a nuclear power plant at something like nine hundred dollars per kilowatt less than the US, everything else being the same. And for Korea, it's about $400 per kilowatt less. So these are significant numbers, but clearly they don't explain the big differences factor of two and higher that I show you a couple of slides ago. So that's why I'm calling this aggravating factor. These are second order effects. They're not the main reason, but they certainly uh, make things worse. Now, what could make a difference? Well, the first, I, uh, you know, I'm glad that Matisse showed the uh, small modular reactors earlier, multiple units standardized at the same site, there is clear indication that uh, the workforce learn, uh, learns and the companies learn as they basically build the same plant over and over again, particularly if it's the same site, because then the workforce is basically the same. So that's a no brainer, you know, don't build a reactor here, another reactor there, one here, one there. If you have to uh, start the construction site, build as many reactors on one site as, as, as you can. Um, and number two to the right, integration maybe in floating platform and barges. Uh, you know, the construction site, as I said, is a fairly low productivity environment. Um, shipyards tend to be much higher productivity. So if you can integrate nuclear reactors into barges, you have an example uh, there on the right, that's an actual nuclear, nuclear power plant that uh, has been built in Russia on a barge and is now operating in the Arctic. Um, that might actually reduce the cost quite a bit. Uh, modular construction coming down on the bottom right uh, techniques. So don't assemble and uh, big things at the site, but assemble them in again in factories and shipyards, and then transport those big modules to uh, to the site that typically slashes the labor at the construction site, therefore making uh, the cost go down. And then all the way to the left there is advanced concrete solution. So a large part of the cost in building traditional nuclear power plants is associated with reinforced concrete. Uh, rebar uh, and the formwork that have to be built and then stripped off um, that take a lot of time, takes a lot of time and a lot of cost. And there are uh, new solutions that you can implement, for example, steel plate composites or, or steel bricks, as they call them, uh, that can slash the, uh, the, the labor quite dramatically. So with these innovations, the idea is that you shift labor from site to factories, uh, you standardize the design that reduces licensing and engineering costs, and then shorten the construction schedule, which I haven't mentioned it, but obviously reduces also the interest during, that you pay during construction. That's significant. Um, this is not a new approach. In other industries that we've surveyed, uh, for example, chemical plants or even nuclear submarines that are built in shipyards in the US, the capital cost reduction from the implementation of these approaches has been in the range of 10 to 50%. So potentially transformational, big, big reduction in cost. Okay, I want to spend the last, uh, let's see how much time do I have, maybe another 10 minutes. I want to spend the last 10 minutes talking about the uh, advanced reactors. So I focus now on building uh, new reactors that, uh, but are, that are still sort of the same traditional gigawatt scale um, electricity uh, for electricity production. Now, what about advanced reactors? Now, I think that at least in the US and Western Europe, we, we need a, um, a, a paradigm shift. Uh, in the deployment. I already mentioned this. I think uh, machines will, you know, these reactors will, will have to become smaller and more serially manufactured. A model that I like very much is that of a jet engine shown up there on the, on the top right. Uh, a jet engine, if you think about it, is a little power plant. It actually generates about 50 megawatts of mechanical power when the airplane is taking off. Um, and, and the size is such that these machines can be built in, uh, in factories as, as is shown up there. And they're very, very productive uh, environments. So why not shrinking the size of reactors down to something that looks like that and, uh, and making them in factories? The second point is that we need to accelerate testing and licensing. It cannot take 10 years to, to license a new reactor. It's just too long. From an investment and innovation cycle point of view, it's not, not sustainable. Um, and then lastly, 
why only connect nuclear power plants to the grid? Sure, electricity is important, and we're going to try to electrify as much as we can. But there is a lot more than the grid. And so, uh, and, and the grid, by the way, once the electrons are on the grid, it's a commodity market. So you're not going to make a lot of money. The, the margins are not large. But if you start looking at markets um, that are not commodity markets, then then you can make uh, you know you can make more money. So keep in mind these three points as I now I'm going to go through some some of these slides. So smaller machines. This was mentioned by Matthias in the previous uh, in the previous presentation. I think the industry gets this. Uh, you know, at least in the West, we're moving away from the from the big beasts. Uh, 1,000 megawatts and plus, and we're going more towards small modular reactors, uh, maybe order of a couple of hundred megawatts. The example that is shown here was already mentioned earlier. It's the BWRX 300 by GE, very interesting simplified design. Um, and uh, the, the target overnight construction cost in this case is less than $1,200, uh, $2,500 per kilowatt, which would be fantastically good. And the levelized cost of electricity would be less than $50 per megawatt hour, which again, would be quite competitive. Uh, ideal size for coal and natural gas plant replacement. Uh, coal plants don't tend to be gigawatt scale. They tend to be a few hundred megawatts. So you can replace a coal plant with a, with a small modular reactor. And the magnitude of the investment uh, uh, here could be of the order of a billion dollars, which is a lot of money, but it's much, much less than, than, than a large um, EPR, you know, $10 billion or whatever is the cost there. Uh, they're also designed for frequent load following, which is going to be the new normal for uh, uh, grids with a lot of renewables. You need to be able to sort of follow the load a little bit. And, and they have some interesting uh, characteristics in terms of uh, security and certainly in, ter in terms of safety. Um, now, this is a little bit more extreme concept. I, I like it very much. And what if we go to really, really small systems, right? So now remember what I said about the jet engine. Now, this is a nuclear reactor that looks a little bit like a jet engine and I call it a nuclear battery. So think about a nuclear reactor that can generate of the order of 10 megawatts of heat and electricity. Of course, it's carbon free because it's nuclear and it's designed to be dry cool. So it doesn't even need to be close to a body of water, whether it's the ocean or river or lake, et cetera. It's entirely built in a factory, just like a jet engine. It is deployed in uh, a standard container that is shown in this, in this image over here. You can see it's basically a small object. And in terms of operation, it would be plug and play. So it comes with a set of standardized interfaces so that a customer wants heat or electricity, they can get their energy within days or weeks as opposed to waiting you know, three, four, five years for the construction of a nuclear plant. Uh, because of economic reasons, it has to be semi-autonomous operation. You cannot afford to have a hundred operators here. It just costs too much. So, but we have the, you know, the capabilities in terms of instrumentation and control to design reactors that are essentially autonomous. And then lastly, very, very important, this could be refueled only three to five years, maybe even up to 10 years. And then once the uh, nuclear battery is exhausted, so to speak, you send it back to a central facility where it's refueled and refurbished. So there is no refueling on site, which means there is no handling or storage or radioactive material. So the customer gets electricity or the heat. They don't have to deal with them. Um, with the with the nuclear fuel at all, which is which is certainly good. Um, uniquely compact and reliable. Here I'm sort of repeating myself, but I just wanted to show you that the scale that green um, uh, that that little green rectangle uh, shown here would be the size, the physical size of a 10 megawatt nuclear reactor, and compared to an equivalent uh, uh, nominal capacity from from wind and solar. So uh, maybe the last set of considerations here on, on safety. Uh, of course, very, very important. In order to be viable, nuclear has to remain very safe and, and maybe, even, maybe even improve. From a technical point of view, what does it mean? Um, there are three safety functions that have to be always achieved. And if you can do it without external intervention, either by operators or by diesel generators, uh, pumps, et cetera, then... Uh, you realize what I would call a walk away safe system. In other words, the plant takes care of itself. Nobody has to intervene. Even if there is an accident, nothing happens. And uh, it is possible to do it with these new, with these new technologies because you have often uh, coolant that does not boil off. So you retain that cooling capability. You have fuel that is very, very robust. You have a high thermal capacity. So the system absorbs a lot of energy without, uh, without heating up too much. Um, and then you have the so-called engineer safety systems, which are passive. They don't require uh, uh, batteries. They don't require uh, pumps. They don't require emergency diesel generators, et cetera. The implication of all of this is that accidents that, of course, are on everybody's mind, like TMI, Chernobyl, 
Fukushima are essentially eliminated by design. So you don't have to worry about that. And importantly, the emergency planning zone, so the, 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 the zone that could be affected by an accident is now limited to site boundary. So there would be no need for evacuating people or having them to do drills or, or training uh, for evacuations and things of that type. I think th these characteristics, frankly, are, are a, a hard requirement going forward. Uh, for nuclear. And I would say particularly in a country like the Netherlands, where, again, land is at a premium. So presumably these nuclear plants will be located close to uh, urban centers. And so they have to be very, very robust, very reliable. Now, the very last thing I guess I'm going to say here is uh, this business of higher added value or moving away from commodity markets. So higher added value for nuclear could come from policy signal that says, okay, I like the electrons uh, from nuclear because they are not emitting, they have good economic impact. Um, unlikely beyond our control, maybe within the control of some of the folks that are following this presentation because they are in government, certainly beyond my control. Um, I, I, I would place my bet on the second uh, approach, which is, can we capture new markets in which nuclear products could sell at a premium? And that is within reach with, it, with the right technology. And I would argue that small modular reactors and the nuclear batteries uh, that I just uh, described a few minutes ago are the right technology. So this is a, uh, a, a very long list of uh, the kind of applications that nuclear uh, reactors could serve. So again, not just electrons on the grid, but process heat for factories, charging stations for electric trucks or hydrogen vehicles, district heating for neighborhoods and towns, desalination of fresh, uh, fresh waters, microgrids for islands, military bases, Large pumps for flood protection, particularly in the Netherlands, we're going to need a lot of pumping because the sea levels are rising and those pumping requires electricity. So you could place co-located uh, nuclear batteries or small reactors to power those pumps. Even propulsion of commercial freight ships, uh, that's an industry that is very, uh, of course, important in the Netherlands and many other countries. And it's... Uh, um, it's determined to reduce their emissions by an order of magnitude within the next 20 years. They've and, and they've decided that nuclear is one of three options that makes sense, the other one being uh, hydrogen and, and ammonia. So there is a potential role there too. And then things like data centers, containerized farms, indoor aquaculture, and even space, uh, you know, if you look, uh, if you look into the future. Allow me to stop here. Transportation sector is a big one. Uh, if you are to replace uh, gasoline and diesel fuel in the transportation sector, requires a lot of either electricity or electricity and heat if you're going with, with hydrogen. So uh, I keep saying the last thing, this is, I, I promise it is the last thing. I, I, I said at the beginning that I would talk a little bit about the support for nuclear in the US. Um, it, it's interesting. Like I said, uh, you know, they disagree on everything, but uh, at least they agree that nuclear is good and we should have more of it. So you probably heard Bill Gates uh, has been supporting nuclear for a long time. He actually came out very prominently, very publicly just a couple of weeks ago uh, in favor of nuclear saying, you know, we're going to need it and it's going to become politically acceptable again. Uh, there are traditionally s uh, nuclear skeptical organizations like the Union of Concerned Scientists that have also come out with public pronouncements saying we need at a minimum to keep our fleet of nuclear reactors if we don't want to lose ground in uh, in decarbonization. You have climatologists like my colleague, Kerry Manuel at MIT and other prominent climatologists that uh, have, have, have been on the record over and over again saying you cannot decarbonize, deeply decarbonize without nuclear. And then uh, energy sector is at the bottom from both parties uh, making the same point. Let me skip this one. Uh, this you cannot read, but uh, it just shows you in terms of policy, enacted legislation, regulatory programs, federal programs, um, everything that is in place now for nuclear in the United States. And it's quite, quite comprehensive. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm going to make these slides uh, available to, to all of you and you can then peruse the internet here. So, at last, uh, back to where we started. These are the five takeaway messages. I'm not going to reread them. And I'm happy to take any questions now or during the panel. OK, thank you, uh, Jacopo. Buongiorno. Uh, I have some uh, clarification questions. Um, one is, uh, should we focus on traditional uranium reactors in our uh, deployment, or should we investigate more in thorium, molten salt reactor systems, like really innovative stuff? So what is your take on that? 
Well, so, so first sort of a clarification from a technical point of view, uh, molten salt reactors are great designs and they don't need thorium. You can have molten salt reactors with, with a uranium fuel cycle. Uh, but um, the, um, the, the, answer, the short answer, at least in my opinion, is we absolutely do not need thorium. We have an infinite, a virtually infinite amount of uranium uh, and it's dirt cheap. There is already a fuel cycle and an industry that are well established. So to me, it's uranium forever. I don't see the need to go thorium. Okay, um, the nuclear battery concept, uh, can, that, can that be replied for a direct uh, gas turbine replacement? Um, I don't know enough about gas turbines uh, to, to give you a, a, you know, sort of a conclusive answer. Uh, basically what would be replaced is the combustion chamber, which currently is where you burn natural gas. You would need to replace that with a heat exchanger that takes the air from the um, atmosphere to the nuclear reactor, heats it up, and then puts it back into the turbine. Now, gas turbines, when they're used for natural gas, with natural gas, they operate very high temperature, over 1,000 degrees C. With nuclear reactors, you cannot go that high in temperature. So I suspect that, uh, so I'm thinking out loud here, that a one-to-one -one replacement of natural gas turbines with nuclear reactors is not feasible. It's much easier to do the replacement of coal fire plants because they, they use ranking cycles in the uh, range that would be accessible for nuclear heat. Okay, thank you. Uh, and one interesting question about the security of small modular reactors. Uh, mm -hmm. If we are going to uh, build uh, tens or maybe hundreds of these uh, small uh, systems, uh, would it be yeah. uh, feasible to protect them from, uh, well, instances like ter terrorist attacks, uh, stuff like that? Yeah, so I think we need to distinguish here. If uh, we're talking about small modular reactors like BWRX 300, that in terms of security is not going to be that different from the traditional large plants because uh, I, at least I would envision that you would deploy maybe five or six in one location. It would become a fairly large nuclear power plant site and it would have adequate secure uh, security. So a fence obviously, and then some, some arm guards. Um, there is a difference in a sense that all these new reactor designs are being developed with security in mind. Uh, unlike the large light water reactors that we currently operate, they were built back in the 70s and the 80s. Security was not nearly as important as it is now. So what it boils down to is that everybody expects that, for example, these small modular reactors will require fewer arm guards because it's also a cost. Uh, at the site than, than the traditional plants. Now, completely different story if you're asking about the security of these nuclear batteries, because there you're talking truly about a distributed network of uh, energy sources. And so you, you know, the vision here is that you can have these nuclear batteries deployed in, in individual factories or in the basement of a high rise or maybe a shopping mall, you know, who knows, whatever is the application. So I think that their security is, is, a, is a much more serious concern. And uh, uh, I would say that you would certainly uh, design the, the system itself to be incredibly robust and, and you know, there are fairly straightforward ways of doing so with, with uh, multiple shells, obviously, that can withstand certain solicitations, certain loads. But uh, you would certainly start with applications where there is already security uh, built in. So, for example, many factories already have security, so you're adding a, an additional high, high value asset in an environment that already has other high value assets. And so the, you can leverage the existing security uh, with, for, for, your nuclear, for your nuclear system. I would certainly start with, with those as opposed to, again, putting in, I don't know, in a shopping mall where you would need to create a dedicated security system for, for the nuclear plant. I don't know if that answers, but uh, whoever asked the question, that's a great question. That's, that's one of the um, potential showstoppers for nuclear batteries, not at all for small modular reactors. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, then we sort of will rebuild our uh, uh, screen for uh, having our panel with us. Uh, so if all the panelists can uh, just uh, unlock their microphones and cameras. Um, and I see that, um, yeah, Pat Patrick Baudin is already with us. Um, I have a, a, really before we start our panel discussion, I have a question for Patrick Baudin and I'll first introduce you to him. Patrick Baudin is the founder of Atom Alliance, Atom Alliance, and presently the only energy retailer in the Netherlands that sells 100% nuclear power. 
The company started last summer and enables energy consumers to support nuclear energy by using it. A large portion of its profit presently is donated to scientific research into the next generation of nuclear technology. Uh, Patrick, um, can you explain to us very briefly what are certificates of origin and why do they matter for consumers who want to buy clean nuclear power now? Yeah, thanks guys. Um, yes, well, uh, certificates of origins, uh, CEOs, um, in a nutshell, um, thanks to CEOs, uh, if you're in the Netherlands, you can now choose for 100% nuclear energy as a consumer. Um, last year, uh, I wanted to change energy supplier and I wanted to make a statement for nuclear energy. Um, the same way as people make a statement uh, by choosing 100% uh, wind energy or 100% renewables in general. Uh, but I wanted 100% nuclear energy and that wasn't possible. Uh, so eventually I decided to uh, start my own energy provider, uh, Atom Alliance, Atom Alliance. Uh, for people that wanted the same thing that I wanted. Um, we don't do a lot of marketing. Uh, we also don't pay fees to comparison uh, websites and we have no margin on the, on the power price. Um, so we're amongst the, the cheapest uh, power suppliers in, in the Netherlands. And uh, we, as, as you mentioned, uh, we donate to uh, scientific uh, research in the Reactor Institute of the TU Delft. Um, so back to the COOs, because um, how can you guarantee 100% nuclear power? Because uh, we have one big interconnected uh, European grid uh, that contains power from all kinds of sources. Uh, so in order to prove who is using what kind of source, uh, well, you need a tracking system uh, of what, what is being produced. Um, generators, they, they need to issue uh, guarantees of origins for uh, renewables and certificates of origin for nuclear and fossil fuels. Um, and, and these provide for, uh, for this tracking system. So basically uh, a COO is uh, a digital proof that says um, uh, that one megawatt of, of nuclear power is being produced at a specific place and is being delivered to the grid. Okay, so you, we get bona fide nuclear kilowatt hours. Yes, thank yeah. you. For, yeah. for, for every megawatt uh, that a consumer uh, uh, uses, we buy one megawatt of, uh, of okay. nuclear power via COOs. So basically, thank you. The, yes, the, the power to uh, to choose uh, for a specific energy source, and it helps uh, it helps you to support nuclear energy and make uh, nuclear energy cool again. Thank so, you. Great. Everybody will join, uh, will join at atomalliancy.nl to support uh, nuclear and also help us increase uh, uh, the donations uh, in thorium research and small modular reactors. Thank you. So now I'm going to int introduce the rest of our uh, panel members, the other panel members, and I'm starting with Amanda uh, Hovers. Uh, Amanda, we, know, we got to know Amanda in the reality TV show uh, Utopia, where she asked attention for animal rights and for sustainability. Uh, she has her own foundation called No Meat for Now, uh, with which she focuses on the image of meat versus vegan. Her degree in environmental law sparked her passion for a clean and safe environment, and of course, also for nuclear energy. Amanda, what contribution can the use of nuclear energy uh, what, contribution, what contribution can use of nuclear energy have to keeping our environment healthy? Yes. Well, I think a lot has been said already. It's very clean and um, a lot of people are still dying from air pollution. So that's one thing. In our country, 12,000 people a year. So that's a big plus of nuclear energy. It doesn't take up much space. So you have more space for ecosystems and biodiversity. We need ecosystems also for the climate to store carbon and to uh, regulate water. That's very important. But of course, the main thing is climate change. That's the biggest environmental problem we are facing right now. And for me, it's crazy that the, the political parties in the Netherlands that are uh, you know, most um, yeah, worried about climate change at the same time are like, eh, we don't need nuclear energy. Eh, we yes. don't need it. That, for me, that's crazy. You know, it's like we are at war and 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 you don't want to use fighter jets, you know. So okay. I think yeah. we really need it. Clear. 
thank you. Um, next panel member is uh, uh, Miriam Nelissen. Uh, Miriam holds an engineering degree at uh, TU Delft and works as a research scientist at TNO, Netherlands Organization for Applied Scientific Research. Uh, she works on the safety of bridges, tunnels, and sluices. She is a member of the parliament in the province of South Holland for the VVD with a portfolio of energy, agriculture, and mobility. Miriam is also candidate number 69 on the list of the VVD for the parliamentary elections on the 17th of March. Miriam, why is your party VVD uh, going for nuclear energy? Yeah, as uh, VVD, we uh, see that the challenge for the energy transition is uh, enormous and we will not make it with uh, sun and uh, wind only. We would need uh, 8,000 wind turbines uh, of 250 meters high um, or almost 30% of our uh, agricultural land uh, for sun. Uh, so we have to look further. And nuclear energy is uh, it's reliable, it's safe, uh, it takes up little space, and it's not weather dependent. So it's a good addition to the uh, uh, mix of um, uh, generation methods. Okay, thank you. Um, in the uh, flyer, we have promised to have uh, Nilifer Gunagan with us uh, for Vault, but she has got called away. Uh, maybe that's has to do with the uh, polls for a vault in the elections. Uh, that's going very nicely. Uh, but anyway, she's not here. So I'm going to my uh, last but not least uh, panel member is Mark Harbers. Uh, Mark Harbers is a Dutch politician uh, who served as a sta state secretary for justice and security in the third Rutte cabinet from 26 October to uh, in 2017 till May 2019. He's a member of the People's Party for Freedom and Democracy, the VVD, and of course, he's also number seven on the VVD list of the House of Representatives for the elections that we'll, we'll have on Wednesday. Mark Harbis, when are we going to build those nuclear power plants and start producing boatloads of clean energies to achieve our Paris goals? Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to learn that uh, uh, Nilever Gundogan from uh, Volt is not with us anymore uh, tonight, but at least I'm very happy that we have another party added to the political scene, uh, which is in favor of uh, uh, nuclear uh, energy. And I would also like to uh, uh, say thanks to the um, uh, to Wim Fleur and Matthijs Beckers, and especially to Jacopo Buongiorno for his very, very excellent uh, lecture tonight. Um, and it was very good to at least learn that there's um, a very uh, that this is a part bipartisan theme in in the US and I think it's really a pity that here in the Netherlands uh, where we started this debate without any taboos and and asked from other parties to look at the uh, the case of nuclear uh, power also without any taboos because we simply don't have the luxury to sort out of any options that for, for carbon-free uh, energy in 2050. Uh, and I'm very sorry to learn that other parties that reject nuclear power at this, uh, at this moment don't have a very convincing alternative for nuclear power uh, as well, especially given uh, the lack of space in, uh, uh, in the Netherlands, because it's, it's all, they put all their cards on uh, solar power and nuclear power which uh, uh, solar power and wind power, which is good as long as the wind power is generated at the North Sea. Uh, the solar energy is generated with solar panels on the roofs of uh, buildings, but we simply don't have the big amount of land uh, space available for a high amount of uh, wind power and solar power. Uh, so when are we gonna build these uh, um, uh, nuclear power plants in, in the Netherlands? Well, it was as, uh, Wim Fleuren already uh, stated, uh, we not only have to construct or, or produce uh, renewable energy for the next 10 years, but within the next 10 years, we also have to make plans for the decades in the 30s and the 40s, so the period from 2030 till 2050. And there was a very good lesson tonight in one of the slides of uh, Mr. Buongiorno. Uh, that was the slide that said, well, okay, here in Europe and in the US, we have started the, the, the construction of these plants where the design of the uh, plants was uh, uh, for less than 50% uh, ready. 
and uh, that was a bit it is a bit difficult with the regulatory process which is very adverse to uh, design changes we've seen that with the construction of the new nuclear power plant in finland we've seen that with the construction of the recent uh, 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 power plant in flamanville in in france so i think we have to keep this lesson uh, in mind so i would love to be building a new nuclear power plant in 2030 or, or some years before but um, uh, actually i'm not sure if we can have it up and running in 2000, uh, 2030 uh, i think that's a bit unrealistic but at least we need um, uh, we need all the plans in, in place in, in in the next uh, term of, uh, uh, of of a new cabinet um uh we have to start thinking about this new development of small modular reactors but in the meantime i would suggest build one or two of the existing eprs uh, uh, that is uh, uh, available um and prepare for this huge amount of extra electricity that we need uh, be uh, beyond 2030 uh, and as you all know, um, uh, nuclear power is one of the elements in the uh, uh, energy mix of the VVD until uh, 2050. Okay. Uh, um, in your question was also, when do we start to build? I have to bring it uh, to, to remind you that the government doesn't actually build these nuclear uh, uh, power uh, uh, plants, as we also don't build uh, uh solar fields and 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 um uh, wind power uh, uh parks but we have to work um hard on new rules new regulation and also opening up subsidies uh for uh, nuclear power especially um i, I think there's a reason to to uh, also invest subsidies in nuclear power given uh, the the small amount of land use for nuclear uh, power which is actually a very good benefit for uh, Dutch uh, uh, society. And as we have subsidized uh, uh, wind power and solar power as well, um, we should subsidize th this form of um, uh, carbon-free energy uh, as well. And also okay. very important, invest in more European cooperation in the next, uh, uh, in the next years. Um, uh, um, in Finland, in France, in Sweden, uh, and even if our, in our former EU friends of uh, the UK, there's a lot of knowledge available uh, on uh, nuclear power, and uh, I think it's uh, it, it would be very wise to invest in in the cooperation on the, uh, the future development of nuclear power. Okay, I think Thank we uh, when we start building uh, nuclear power plants, uh, we also have to do a lot of communication with uh, with the public, with the audience, and. Um, in previous webinars, uh, we have uh, received a lot of questions. And, and when you really look at the questions, they focus around several subjects. And some questions uh, are repeated again and again. Um, and I want to, uh, to challenge this uh, panel to, to have a small discussion about, uh, we are going to do a, little, a, a couple of little polls, actually, with the, with the audience. Um, so I want to ask the audience to answer to answer a couple of questions. And uh, Mitchell, can we have the first poll question on screen, please? Yes, of course. I think it, it should be. Oh, it are it, 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 all the questions are uh, asked uh, simultaneously. Oh yeah, well. Oh, that's uh, that's a bit of an issue. Um, well, let's 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 only do the first, the number one, and I'll, I'll uh, it's this is. Um, yeah, well, I have to explain. In every webinar we organized so far, we have gotten uh, questions about the waste that is being produced by nuclear reactors. Um, so the question is, uh, nuclear, today's nuclear power produces an, an amount of waste that is pretty constant per unit of energy. And I want to have your opinion about this waste. Um, and you can choose from three alternatives. One is waste presents an unacceptable risk for future generation or B, this uh, waste can be safely managed and stored based on broadly held scientific consensus. And the third one is uh, the waste is something I don't really understand, but would like to learn more about. So can you allow the audience to vote right now? They're voting.
Can you see how the process is going? Need twelve percent now, thirteen. But uh, everyone is answering all the questions. But yeah. <laughs> really, <laughs> it's not quite the interaction. But I maybe uh... <laughs> give it one minute and everyone. Has, and all right, please, can... people, only answer the first question. You will get an opportunity to the answer the other ones. Ah, uh, uh, they need to answer all the questions, otherwise they can't submit. I'm uh, oh. A little bit of a technical thing, but uh, right. it's going it's going quite fast. So let's take our time for uh, answer all questions. Take your time. Okay. I'll give it uh, one other minute, and I'll end the poll. I think. It's going quite fast now, almost done. Good. Last two questions are political questions. Ten more seconds, and I'm gonna close the polling. Okay. So the last votes are coming in. So. If it's, uh, I think you can see the results now, right, guys? Uh, yeah, right. Indeed. Uh, I don't know if the other panelists can see them as well. Everybody can see the results? Yeah? Yes. Good. Um, yeah, uh, I'm moving this thing across my screen so I can see all the panelists. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, well, for the first uh, uh, question, we have a, a, a percentage of uh, 97, 79% uh, who is of the opinion that uh, it can be safely managed and stored based on broadly sci held scientific consensus. Um, Jacobo, can you comment about on this on this outcome? Is it is this what you expected? Uh, well, I, the, the outcome of all five questions is incredibly positive, and I suspect it's a result of the self-selected audience today, right? <laughs> um, so I, 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 I guess, I yes, in hindsight, I should, I, I should not be surprised. I would be very surprised if this was the answer from the general public. Uh, but I think those are the right answers. I mean, I, you know, not <laughs> consistently with what I presented a few minutes ago. Yeah, on the other hand, I see a 19% uh, who uh, stresses the fact that they, they need to learn more about it. So it's not some... Uh, is this something uh, we think? Uh, well, like, uh, uh, let me ask this question to Mark Harbers. I, I think when we choose for any uh, uh, energy system, it's very important to have a really large support from a large part of the population. Um, is, is there? Is there? Uh, uh, do you have a? Uh, well, does the VVD have a certain vision on how 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 are we going to educate people about uh, the uh, reality of uh, this uh, yeah, this this power system? When we choose, especially when yeah. we choose for nuclear power, because these these are relevant questions. People ask about safety. People ask about uh, uh, the, the the waste, uh, and we have to talk a lot, a lot about it. What is it? What can be uh, uh, done with it? Um, and also, for for instance, um, uh, people tend to think that if you don't have a nuclear power plant, you don't have nuclear waste, which is not true. Uh, here in the Netherlands, we have one of the, uh, uh, the, the biggest nuclear reactors, for instance, for, for medical uh, use in, in the world, which produces nuclear waste as well. And we have to store that as well. Um, uh, and you have to talk a, a lot about it also in, an, in a non-technical way, because I think it's true what the third answer 
po the possibility states that uh, for a lot of people, it's something that they don't really understand. Um, um, I'm not a technician as well, so I really don't understand it as well, but I've read a lot about it. Uh, so I can explain it to other people, but we have to we have to talk a lot about it just also to to take away the worries that that people might uh, might have. I have a question also about uh, waste. To Jacopo, I think you know the answer. Can we reuse this waste? In, in large part, you can, uh, but you have to reprocess the fuel and then extract the materials that are still useful and set aside the, the materials that are no longer useful. It's done routinely in places like France and, and uh, in, in the US for military uh, fuel, but it's not done uh, broadly. And it's, it entails a cost and there is also a potential concern about proliferation because when you separate the useful materials from the non-useful, uh, you end up with relatively clean plutonium, which is fuels for uh, for weapons. So in, in my opinion, we don't need to do that. The, 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 the volumes, uh, as I showed, are already pretty low. And I, I would say the issue of waste has never been a technical issue. I'm not sure that the general public understands the difference between 10,000 tons and 1,000 tons. Uh, to them, it all sounds big. Uh, yeah. But so the, the point is that, it, it, and if I may make a, a comment, if I, if, since I have the mic here, um, I would resist the temptation to phrase this as we need to educate the public. Uh, it has been shown that the, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, teacher-student model is not the right way to engage with the public. Uh, even You can have the best technical knowledge in the world. If the public uh, doesn't trust you, they, you, you won't get anything across. So it's an issue of trust. And so in, 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 in a way, I would disagree with what Mark said, because you, as a politician, are actually the best position, assuming that your, you know, your constituents trust you in order to have that conversation, even though you don't have a degree in nuclear engineering, it doesn't matter. If they trust you, you'll be able to communicate and engage with them and, and pass along information that they will believe, much more so than you know, me, my, a professor from MIT who comes from, who knows, uh, as far as your constituents are concerned, so. But could you say that, that nuclear waste is superior or that it's preferable over other forms of waste? Well, I, I would say it's, uh, like I said, the volumes are small, but it's nasty stuff. I don't, you know, we need to be clear here. It's because it's highly toxic and it, it, it stays toxic for a long period of time. The really, really good news, in addition to the fact that it's small volume, is that it's also fairly uh, stable. It doesn't want to move around. It's not, it's not very volatile. It doesn't disperse easily. And, and it's fairly, very, very straightforward to contain it uh, for long periods of time. So... You know, uh, all technologies produce uh, materials that we don't particularly like. Uh, there is always a trade-off. Now, I think the conversation here needs to start among us and also with the public, uh, with the benefits. Why do you want to mess with this technology to begin with, right? With nuclear, and the benefits have, have come out in today's presentation is because you might really need it to solve important problems here, which is uh, obviously climate change and then energy security uh, for for many countries and uh, also energy justice, if you wish. In, in other parts of the world. Okay, uh, let's look uh, briefly at the second, uh, the outcomings of the second question. Um, this um, is an interesting one because we are last uh, last uh, week we had the anniversary of, um, well, basically ten years uh, after the Zendai uh, tsunami. Uh, in our newspapers, uh, this um, uh, was largely referred to only as the Fukushima incident. Um, and uh, yeah, the the, uh, the 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 UNSCEAR report, the report of the United Nations uh, uh, that was republished uh, last week, also stated that has has no been there hasn't been any radiation victim uh, in uh, the as a, as a consequence of the Fukushima incident. Um, Let's look at the outcome. So, what is it? the question? Was what was the best way to prevent another Fukushima from evening ever happening? Well, we see here a similar pattern as with the waste uh, question. Um, Thirty-five percent of people think that it's a, uh, a good idea to build new generation of nuclear power reactors, and uh, also uh, uh, eight percent think it is uh, uh, necessary to educate the population. 
And some people say uh, we have to do both to uh, uh, both alternatives, so both educated people and build a new generation of um, nuclear power reactors. Um, Miriam, you want to comment on these outcomes? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, from uh, from the perspective of the um, um, research scientist on risk analysis, I would say that the um, uh, physical uh, probability of having another uh, Fukushima, so the, the failure of the uh, um, of the reactor, um, can be limited by uh, by uh, preventing the uh, or, or limiting the, the probability. Um, so that would be more. Uh, technical challenge, so to say. Um, and what, what I understood from F Fukushima is that uh, a lot of people died in uh, the process of getting uh, evacuated and from stress. And uh, from that perspective, I think that um, and maybe education is not the right word in that, but I think we should somehow inform people uh, in a more objective way uh, uh, about the risks um, uh, to be have people better understand what uh, what the risks are and that they are really uh, very small also compared to um, to other uh, sources of energy, uh, like Mr. Bongiorno showed in his slides. Right. I would like to add something. Um, right. the, tra the tragedy of Fukushima is that it was preventable. Um, the, the, TEPCO, TEPCO knew uh, about the shortcomings of the Fukushima Daiichi plant and didn't, didn't act on it. Now, I always say we have to first give them a hand and then punch them in the face. So first we, we give them a hand for the, for the experience that we, that we have actually gotten. And we have learned from what has happened in Fukushima. And then we should punch them in the face for the risks that they took with this plant because at the other plants there i believe there were three that were hit, seriously hit by the tsunami only one failed the other two withstood it with flying colors because they had their flood protection in order so so it's a question of of learning you know the human species has survived because we adapt and and this is the this is the lesson that uh, that we should take away from this Okay, um, I think we have to skip a couple of questions because we always why we'll be uh, getting too late. Um, I think an interesting question would be to return to um, to the question that uh, Mark Harbers has already been briefly addressing. Um, it's the last question: Can the Netherlands have new nuclear power by 2030? Um, a majority of the people seems to think that this is uh, possible uh, if we really get serious about it. Um, a smaller percentage uh, says, no, this is out of the question. Um, do we really know what is, what is uh, if, if we really uh, make a sort of a wrap up about uh, the broad field that uh, Jacopo has been uh, showing us, uh, several different systems, uh, smaller, smaller uh, types of reactors. Um, what, 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 what do you think is the time frame that we are, have to be talking about here? Jacopo or me? Both. <laughs> let, let, let me let me start. I think that 2030 is feasible, but highly unlikely. It's feasible because GE Itachi, for instance, they're aiming at 2027 for a first uh, commissioning of a, of a nuclear reactor, uh, which means that whichever country uh, or whichever company decides to adopt and gets into the slipstream of this first development can commission in 2028, 2029, or 2030. Uh, but the bureaucracy in the Netherlands is glacial, can be glacial in this regard. And this means that it can take six, seven, eight years before you get your license to actually get building. Now, the, the positive thing about this GE Itachi X300 is that they that they think that they can build it within three years. So, so that makes it possible. 
feasible, but it's highly unlikely. <laughs> so, so let me let me maybe build on what Matthias just said. Uh, I, I think from a technical point of view, the answer is unequivocally yes. Uh, even Mark made the point a few minutes ago. If you go with a uh, an existing large light water reactor design, uh, particularly one from either China or, or South Korea, you can probably order it tomorrow and definitely within a decade you'll have a power plant in in the Netherlands. If you're interested in these new machines, small modular reactors, etc., Matthias, I think, characterize it correctly. I would add that, uh, and I'm pushing uh, on my side on this, that whatever demonstration project takes place in the U.S. should be an international demonstration, should be leveraged as an international demonstration. So let's stay with the uh, GE Tachi plant. There is no reason why the uh, Dutch regulator should not be part of that project. Uh, it's actually going to be a wonderful synergy and cost savings for everybody involved if the regulator gets to see firsthand that plant as it's been built and, and licensed in the U.S. because that will cut time and cost in the licensing in, in the Netherlands. Ideally, you would want a, an international license the same way that we have international licenses for airplanes. That has been dreamed about and talked about for decades. It's never going to happen because countries want to retain the sovereignty when it comes to licensing nuclear reactors. I don't know why nuclear is so special compared to you know either uh, other industries like the airlines industry, but that's a fact. And so whatever you can do in these demonstration projects to cut the time for a country like the Netherlands to do its own licensing will be very, very welcome. Okay. I can add to that uh, from my my experience. We have been investigating the Dutch uh, uh, regulatory system for, uh, from this uh, the perspective of this question. And it looks like uh, the regulatory uh, system in the Netherlands is actually quite uh, fit for uh, an approach like uh, the one you mentioned. Um, and it seems like it's not the case that the regulations themselves are uh, outdated or unfit for a quick development. It's more like the practices have to be sort of re-established. Re it's, 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 it's more, um, we have to learn to do it again. That's, that's the main point, I think. Um, well, we're moving to 9.30 already, and our, uh, uh, I, um, we have to um, go to the end, I think. Um, maybe I would like to give Mark Harbus uh, uh, time for a few closing words uh, to wrap up the lessons that we may take from this. Yeah, there are so many lessons uh, uh, from these lectures uh, uh, tonight. I think I, I, I won't recap them all because we, we all have to bear them in, no, uh, just, in just, mind. Just, but I, just, just pick, but one, I, to pick out one uh, you like. I, I pick one and that's that's the final remarks that uh, Jacobo and, uh, and Matthijs uh, uh, made. Uh, I would suggest that we are not too focused upon the year two, 2030, which, which is also just one step uh, on our road to uh, uh, the, the, the carbon-free society in, in two, 2050. And I think we have to keep in mind that we have to be focused upon um, the case of nuclear power in order to realize it in the Netherlands, gains people, people's trust, which is at this moment, um, I think the Netherlands is divided into three. There's one third of the people that is against nuclear power, one third that is in favor, and one third that's very... Um, well, that has, has some questions, but is on the positive side say, well, tell me more about it. And I think it might be an option uh, uh, on our way to a carbon free society. So we have to we have to bear in mind that uh, two thirds of the people in the Netherlands is positive or um, uh, at least uh, um, uh, wants to inquire more information about uh, this uh, uh, these options. Um, and um, I think we, we, just as Jacopo said, we should uh, cooperate internationally, especially on the development of these new kind of uh, uh, reactors. Um, and we have to get rid of some bureaucratic rules in the Netherlands, but bear in mind that it's, um, it also has got to do with the density of our country and uh, the density of our land use. So you can never get rid of any uh, of all these uh, procedures. Um, I have to think about the days when I was uh, elderman in Rotterdam, responsible for something that we are very, very used to in the Netherlands, a land reclamation project 
for our ports. I mean, we have ports for, for centuries. We have uh, 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 the tradition of polders and land reclamation. And even that took more than 10 years of um, uh, the, 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 the process to decide upon this, uh, this project, the financing of it. Uh, but and in the end, it was it was uh, uh, realized. So uh, let's stay focused in the next uh, years, and let's especially ask the people that reject nuclear power what alternative they have in mind. And I've, I until now I haven't seen any realistic uh, alternatives for our carbon-free uh, energy uh, uh, the, 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 to provide in our carbon-free energy in 2050. So um, uh, in the ideal energy mix. We need both wind, both solar, both other uh, uh, techniques that are still being developed and nuclear power. Okay, I think those are wonderful words to have uh, sounding in my head. Uh, yeah, well, well last, last thing, very last. Yeah, don't you think we should own the, the climate issue a bit more? Because I think a lot of the time you start talking about 2030 and we can wait a little bit longer. And I think a lot of people who worry about climate change, you know, they 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 get scared from that message you know so maybe you could just say look we have the best solution to climate change because nuclear just can provide a lot of energy very efficiently very re reliably carbon free so maybe we should you know we should we should flip the script a little bit we should say we have the best plan instead of saying well 2030 it, maybe a little bit later you know i think we can, we can oh, that, that, communicate that, that, it a little bit better. Yeah. Uh, it's just realistic to tell people it's not going to be realized in 2030. But on our way to 2050, um, I totally agree with you. We're going to solve this climate problem uh, in the Netherlands. We're going to do it in the, um, in the most intelligent way, in the most uh, uh, financeable way, uh, uh, in the most smart way. And we will earn a lot of money with, with all the new knowledge that we, uh, that we get in, in the next 29 years up on to a carbon-free society. Uh, and we have already started not only two years ago, but already 10 years ago with the first uh, uh, sources of renewable energy. And now it's time to add nuclear to that as well. So I totally agree with you. I, I would suggest that we make scenarios for 2030 and later, because what I researched is devastating. And we don't have research for after 2030. There's only one scenario, that's the ATNO scenario. And that's not enough. If I read the figures, uh, it's, it's a very big, big task that we have ever had. And it will be clear that it's not achievable with just, just solar and wind. So, uh, I think it's if you have the discussion, the open discussion uh, with, for instance, the top of Jacopo, because we have to be knowledgeable about this. We don't know. We've lost all the information from the past. So we have to regain that. And uh, we have to incorporate all um, knowledge together and convey that. It can be a, a very sensible message. Uh, but then we have to be convinced ourselves. Um, so. I want to have scenarios. I'm, I'm really unsure what will happen after 2030. Yeah, that's, uh, you're right. And that's why I mentioned uh, that you, you stated that we have to uh, think now about the 30s and the 40s. Um, on the positive side, at least we have the TNO scenario study right now because it was only published uh, half a year ago. Uh, so at least we have one scenario available, but now we have to think all these scenarios over and also um, uh, look at these scenarios from other points, uh, points of view. For instance, land use, for instance, um, the electricity grid that uh, comes with it or not, um, uh, other solutions for a storage of, uh, uh, of power, hydrogen, etc. We have a lot of work to do, but at least we have, for the first time we have something to start with right now. Uh, and now we have to, to um, uh, combine uh, this with other studies and uh, then you have the real scenarios. And it's really time for it because 2030 is tomorrow. Uh, companies are planning already right now what to install in, in eight years time or, or later on. So they have to um, uh, get the trust that um, their energy uh, uh, supply won't be a problem uh, by then. Okay, I think we have a subject for uh, one of our upcoming webinars.
um, this may be a challenging thing, but um, uh, yes, I, I completely agree. Uh, we need to uh, get a sight on these pathways that we can follow. But for now, I want to uh, thank uh, all the panel members for being with us and uh, having this interesting discussions uh, with us. Um, I want to uh, thank uh, uh, Wim and Matthijs for their presentation. And I want to thank uh, Jacopo for giving his uh, very interesting uh, presentation and his update about uh, yeah, the possible future of nuclear energy. Nuclear energy. And uh, I want to thank the audience for being with us. Um, and um, yeah, we are definitely going to continue on this path of providing you with this, uh, this uh, quality information uh, to, so that we have, can have a real and serious conversation about how to decarbonize our uh, energy system. So good night, everybody, and uh, hope to see you at a next occasion.